All right, let me look at the chat. Good to go. All right. Well, I think it's being recorded as well for uh, prosperity. <laughs> uh, my name is John Downey with Cisco now for almost 22 years, believe it or not. Before that, I was with uh, Secor Electronics, um, WaveTech, Mongo Golderman, which turned into Ecturn, and uh, you name it. So I had a lot of experience in the RF world. And then when I moved into Cisco, basically layer two, layer three of the OSI model. Uh, it's always been CMTS, cable modem, and any variation in between uh, capacity planning, uh, VoIP, um, resiliency, load balancing, features. My title is Senior CMTS Technical Leader uh, because I've been doing the CMTS and DOCSIS and optimization for the whole 22 years. Um, so with Brady Volp, he and I kind of got our uh, you know, feet wet with uh, Doxis and Land City and all that way back when we were Secor Electronics together. Uh, and then I got into the test equipment vendor side of it, uh, which was interesting. And then finally into uh, Doxis with Cisco. Um, so it's been a heck of a, a run and we're still moving along. You know, we're trying to squeeze out of coax as much as we can because we have so much coax already in the ground, already in the air, already deployed. I won't disregard fiber to the home as probably, you know, that's our panacea or holy grail. That's where we want to get to. But there's still economic reasons why it's it's not feasible um, because it costs a lot of money. And I can get fiber further and further closer to the customer, but that last hundred feet or meters, whichever one you're talking about, uh, is difficult. I mean, digging up someone's yard, syncing up schedules with a customer, uh, that alone could be a, a big hassle and time and how to, how to exploit what we already have. And that's what we're doing, right? We're exploiting what we already have. So uh, Mike asked me to talk about Doxus 3.1. And my thought was I could go over some overview stuff on downstream and then upstream, talk about profile management and some things that we've seen over the last five, six, seven years. I lose track of time now because two years were pretty much lost with COVID. Um, you know, Mike, you, you mentioned about uh, utilizing old information and how it never changes or where things end up. I was in Germany last week for the Yonga conference, first trip I've made in almost two and a half years. And uh, it was in Cologne and it was a good, good show. Uh, Cisco didn't have a booth there, but me and my colleague, Jason Miller, we went and had customer meetings and stuff. And people came up to me and they're like, hey, I love your uh, Google, your podcast you do with Brady. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's appreciated that, you know, people actually watch those things. We don't script any of it. We just pretty much fly and go on the fly. And uh, when you deal with different customers in different environments, you get some good feedback on what works and what doesn't work and why there are some hurdles to overcome. Uh, for instance, in uh, Austria, they still carry some FM radio uh, on their cable plant. Well, that's going to be a problem if I try to go 204 megahertz upstream. So those things that uh, I kind of address and what are the pitfalls, what are the hurdles, and how do I get around them, and how are we working towards fixing those hurdles? Um, right now, I like to talk about what we have today, not what could be, but what is and how I make it work better. If I have an issue, how do I work around it? Uh, I'm all about getting things to work more efficiently and get the most speed I can, but also I'm a realist. I know cable plants are living, breathing monsters and uh, you have to have some insurance that it's gonna stay up and running for your end customer. So with that said, I like to deploy all the features at my disposal that make the end customer stay up and running, happy, not complaining. But that means the cable companies need to change some of their mindset on how they do reporting, how they react to the information that's coming back, and how to kind of decipher that information. You know, just because you have P&M doesn't mean it's any good unless you know how to look at it and know what you're looking for. You don't want all this information coming back to you and just raising red flags everywhere, but you don't know what's real, what isn't, what should I address right away or what can I put off? So looking at the 3.1 general stuff and the basics, 
we know the OFDM, the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, the, the block, if you will, is made up of a lot of subcarriers. That's why we don't call it a single carrier qualm because it's multiple carriers. It could be 8,000 carriers. Um, the biggest channel width you can do or block size is 192 megahertz. Now, the actual channel for OFDM is really 204.8. You just don't see that on a spectrum analyzer. So it's part of the spec, it's 204.8, that's part of the clocking, but the real spectrum is 192 max. Now it could have one megahertz of guard band on each side, so it, went, it could be 190 megahertz of actually usable uh, subcarriers, and then there's subcarriers in there for pilot patterns, for probing, um, NCP, next code word pointer. There's a lot of overhead in there as well. But the bigger the channel is, the less percentage that overhead is. So running DOCSIS 3.1 OFDM with the smallest block size of 24 megahertz doesn't make any sense. You might as well stick with single carrier qualm because it's pretty inefficient when you start running smaller blocks. You're better off running the biggest block possible. If you can't do that because of spectrum allocation, then maybe you shorten it up. Uh, maybe you have some exclusion bands. You have to avoid certain frequencies, maybe because of LTE, 4G cell phone interference. Uh, who knows? The mod profiles we see in the cable modems today, 16 qualm up to 4K qualm. We call it 4K qualm, it's 4096. That's a huge constellation. So to really pinpoint the constellation is tough with 4,000 4, symbol landings. You know, in the spec, there was an, even an option for an 8K and 16K qualm, but uh, the cable modems on the market today don't support that. And I doubt that any cable plants would support that unless it was maybe remote five, remote Mac five, right to the tap then it would be a good enough MER. I think I really could run an even higher modulation scheme. Today, I'm running 4K QAM in, in node plus one environments. So the beauty of DOCSIS 3.1 is not the fact that I have more efficient usage of my spectrum, but I have more resiliency as well because I have better control and monitoring of the cable modems. Individually pushing a cable modem to a different modulation than say my neighbors cable modem. Even though we broadcast all out from the head end, we all could easily have different MERs at different frequencies because of high end roll off from water, low end roll off from uh, loose seizure screws. I suck outs are usually from bad grounding or corrosion, something like that. Um, I've even seen cases where, and Mike, you probably remember this, one of the examples I had way back in 97 or where it was. No, I, I was at uh, C Corp from 90 to 94. Uh, one of the weirdest ones was, you know, the technician putting the drop cable down the side of the house and thinking they were going to be nice and clean and they stapled it to the side of the house every two feet. That turned out to be a really bad problem because you're creating micro dents in the coax, creating impedance mismatches evenly spaced. When you evenly space something, it adds up. So now you have a suck out of specific frequency based on the distance or spacing of those staples. Um, moral of the story was, one, don't staple it, or two, don't try to be nice and evenly staple it. <laughs> they would have like changed up the spacing of the staples, it wouldn't have been as bad. And it's kind of interesting. Um, so these are some basic points of DOCSIS 3.1 downstream. We know we are cross-bonding the 3.1 with the 3.0, 2.0 single carrier qualms. Remember, single carrier qualm, uh, Brady brought up earlier today, is haystacks. We just call it a haystack. Now, some of the words we use don't translate very well when you go to Germany or Japan. Believe me, when I try to talk about uh, upstream piggybacking, it was difficult to figure out how to translate that in another, another language. Um, but these are some terms that we use very loosely in the cable industry because that's it's even in the spec, but it's really terms that have been brought down through society. Um, so cross bonding is always gonna happen because we're probably gonna have 3.0 and 2.0 modems. Some places have got, we eliminate 2.0 modems completely, but 3.0 modems, I need the single carrier qualms for 3.0 modems. Uh, if I want more efficiency and more speed, I'm upgrading the 3.1 modems and pushing those modems to 3.1 spectrum, meaning OFDM on the downstream. The modems on the market today do support 32 single carrier qualms and two OFDM blocks. And I say 32 single carrier qualms, I'm really talking about Annex B, six megahertz wide in North America. But in Europe, Annex A is an eight megahertz wide channel. 
So in theory, you could get even more speed from an Annex A modem. Ironically enough, when we went to DOCSIS 3.1, there is no Annex A, Annex B anymore. It's Annex A, Annex B for the 3.0 spectrum, the same, same carrier qualm, but OFDM, OFDMA, DOCSIS 3.1, there is no Annex mode. It's not even mpeg 2 ing encapsulated like uh, single carrier qualms are. Uh, so we eliminate a little bit of overhead since there's no MPEG-2 encapsulation. We allow up to 4K qualm support, even though there are options for 8K and 16K qualm, like I said, but I've never seen any modems that support that yet. I suspect the DOCSIS 4.0 CPE, when it comes out, would have maybe that option in it, uh, along with the extended spectrum DOCSIS, maybe to 1.8 gigahertz. Now, when 3.1 first came out, most systems were one gigahertz, but the spec said 1.218 with a 1.794 gigahertz option. Now that 1.8 gigahertz roundup has been pushed to the DOCSIS 4.0 spec. And we call that ESD or extended spectrum DOCSIS or uh, frequency division, do frequency FDD, frequency domain, yeah, whatever. <laughs> the last bullet point I said, what about the cable modem upstream diplex motor? Just because the chipset in the modem says it supports a certain upstream downstream doesn't mean the hardware filter in there does. So there could be a lot of modems in the market today, DOCSIS 3.1, that the chipset says 204 upstream support, but the internal filter in the modem itself very well could be 42, 85. In Europe, it could be 65. There's even a, a 3.1 cutoff of 117 that many people don't even know about or don't even talk about. So it's a concern for me because I've seen that 117 cause a problem where I was testing OFDMA on the upstream and I just wanted to do a block from say 40 to, or maybe 80 to 110, 30 megahertz. But because I didn't exceed that 117 fake invisible line, the modem reported back that, hey, you're not trying to go above 117, and all I have is a 85 filter or 20 filter, 204 filter. So I'm going to switch you to the 85 filter. So even though I was trying to test OFDMA, the modem wouldn't support it. So I had to test above 117 so that the modem said, oh yeah, let's activate the 204 filter, and then it would actually do the OFDMA above 80 to 117, 120, whatever. This is kind of looking at my downstream spectrum, what it could be, where it is, some of the options. Um, I believe you should be able to see my mouse moving. I like to use it as a pointer. Uh, five to 42 in the US, really US typically five to 40. You know, we had problems with uh, chrominance and luminance delay on channel two. So most filters dropped to 40 megahertz, so it wasn't such a brick wall uh, filter. So I wrote down 42.54. Next split, so I wrote down 85.102, but the spec really was an 85105. But most Diplex filters go to 85102 because they're set top boxes, legacy set top boxes that have a downstream out of band at 104. So if we did a 105 split or a 105 filter, this downstream set top box wouldn't work. So we shrunk that down to an 85102. The next one is a 117150, which no one really utilizes. And the one that we're looking at and trying to exploit now is 204 to 254. So there's a pattern there. Notice when we increase our upstream spectrum, the diplex filter no man's land gets worse. It's usually about a 25%. So the higher the upstream spectrum, the more the unused band for the diplex filter. And that is a concern. That's why some people looked at something called full duplex doxis, FDX. Uh, and that has its own inherent issues as well, which is why the industry is kind of uh, fractured a little bit between FDX and FDD, you know, extended spectrum boxes. So I have to worry about potential ingress sources. Uh, where is my ALC pilot? What about 4G mobile interference? Uh, do I have to do a block above one gigahertz? And if I do, what's going to happen with Mocha? You know, I think it's channel, channel. Uh, what is it, C or D in Mocha, it's like 1.15 gigahertz. I may have to exclude or avoid that frequency altogether. Uh, I don't want to interfere with it, and I don't want, it, want Mocha interfering with me. And, and Mocha is just a multimedia over coax alliance, and 
it sends out really high signals to talk to other devices in the house. It could be plug and play devices. So you might not have much say over that. So these are some of the frequency bands. FM band is there, 88 to 108. It might be in our best interest to sort of avoid that frequencies uh, until uh, FM radio goes away and we just go XM and just do digital like we did off air video, all right? Get rid of the uh, analog altogether. So I did a presentation a while back for SET. Heck, it was like 2017, five years ago already. And I talked about some of our interference testing, me and Jason Miller did. And it, it kind of opened our eyes to how efficient and resilient LDPC is, low density parity check in DOCSIS 3.1, time and frequency interleaving, and how the fast Fourier transform actually works, the FFT. And what was interesting is, by injecting noise at one frequency, you expected those frequencies to really drop out. But because it's intermixing the symbols in time and frequency and this FFT, we found that the worse it got in one part of the spectrum because of ingress, if it got to a certain point, like below 25 dBmeR, then the whole block started degrading, which was interesting because how can ingress at one frequency affect all the other frequencies? And it's because of the complex nature of the OFDM, which was very, it was eye-opening in that, does it do me any good to exclude spectrum because of potential interference? Maybe, maybe not. Does it make sense to maybe allow profile management to individually look at every modem and say, who actually has interference? And I'll just give a different mod profile to that modem. But do I want that one modem to change modulation for the whole block just because one frequency is bad? That's not a good trade off. To go from 4K qualm getting close to 1.8 gigabit per second for one block and drop all the way down to 256 qualm just for that modem, that doesn't make any sense. You're not only affecting that one modem. But if that modem has to take more time to do his own traffic because he's doing a lower modulation, doesn't that make sense that he's you're sharing the same block? He's taking up more time. So the utilization of that block could look worse just because one guy is not running efficiently. And it might not be one guy, it might be two guys, three guys, five guys. Either way, there's this philosophical standpoint of is it better to have a modem run lower modulation or is it better for that modem to go into partial mode since you're cross bonding with single carrier qualm do i allow the modem to say you know what don't even transmit on OFDM, OFDM anymore just transmit on the the uh, single carrier qualms but now you run the risk of that modem with a high quality of service offering to maybe start eating up the 30 traffic so there's a there's a, a thought process or a philosophical uh, reasoning. It's like, I could drop modulation, but I don't want to drop it too low, and I don't want to drop it too long. So I want the system to be self-aware and change itself on the fly uh, when modems say I'm bad or modems say I'm good to go back again. So I want everything as, as, efficient, as efficient as possible. Um, so it was kind of interesting that if I have an ingress area, like potential LTE, 4G mobile, it might be better for us to uh, change some of our thresholds to either ignore that area for the profile management decisions or do a lower modulation in that spectrum, but not totally exclude it. Because if you exclude 20, 30 megahertz of spectrum, you just lost out quite a bit of usable bandwidth. So you're losing speed either way. We're trying to squeeze out as much as we can out of this. This was from a modem itself. And what's interesting is it's showing the percentage of subcarriers that could work at 16K qualm, even though this modem doesn't have 16K qualm, 8K qualm, 4K, 2K. So some of my subcarriers, percentage of them are about 31 dB MER. And what's Interesting with this display is it's showing an MER cutoff that is 
actual for that modulation. But that's not the cutoff Cable Labs recommends. Cable Labs has a table that we abide by in the CMTS that makes all these numbers 6 dB more conservative. <coughs> Excuse me. So 4K qualm, I know it'll break about a 35 dB MER, but the internal table in the Cable Labs table says 41. So if I use the internal table as thresholds, I am 6 dB more conservative than I need to be. And if the MER of a modem gets reported back to the CMTS, it says, hey, I got a, I got a 38 dB MER, then the CMTS is going to say, I need to drop you from 4K qualm down to like 2K qualm. When in reality, I know 4K qualm will work perfectly fine. So there are some suggestions we have now to get the most speed you can, but still give you assurances and insurance that the modem is going to be self-aware or self-healing to drop modulation when it needs to. Uh, PLC, the, the physical link control channel, uh, is 16 qualms, so it's very resilient. Um, by default, it ends up about midway in the middle of your OFDM block. Um, I say as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I would put my PLC somewhere in the spectrum I know is not going to be interfered with by off-air digital broadcasters, um, LTE interference, uh, high-end roll-off, um, anything that you think might get in your system, you know, why put my PLC where it might get uh, really, you know, jacked up? Even though it's 16 qualm, it's really robust, I still don't want to you know, play with fire. I don't want to put it where, you know, at maybe 750 megahertz or 800 megahertz where in my neighborhood there's a lot of LTE interference at 800 megahertz because of at and there or something like that. I believe cross-bonding is still in our best interest. We can get the most bang for our buck. If I have one of the M block optimized almost 1.8 gigabit uh, per second, and then I have 32 single carrier qualms cross bonded. If you add that up, that's like three gigabit per second aggregate pipe. You could offer one or two gigabit per second offering. You know, it's 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 a stretch, but there's no reason why we couldn't. Uh, we're now looking at two OFDM blocks and bonding those two together, so that's almost four gig plus the one gig from the 32 single hair qualm, that's five gig. So from a five gig aggregate, we could offer a two and a half, three gig offering. I usually like to offer maybe half of the total aggregate. You wouldn't want to offer five gig from a five gig pipe because one person could starve out everybody else. And keep in mind, just because we offer it doesn't mean people are actually using it, right? And most of this is a speed race. You know, the most of the, the highest speeds we see on a system are actually created by speed tests. It's not from actually applications. So perception is reality. So when 3.1 cable modem reports non-primary RF channel impairment, non-primary means the, the secondary downstream channel, not the channel it's locked on for keep alive and, and synchronization. Um, this is philosophical as well. Should I use an OFDM primary or stick to my single carrier qualm primary? Now, the OFDM PLC, so robust, it's probably not gonna go down primary-wise, it's probably great. But I've seen some great responses from keeping the single carrier qualm as a primary because I have some commands where I can force voice calls to the primary. And if I force them to 256 qualm, I know they're gonna be really robust and they, they stay on the single carrier qualm. Um, and if the OFDM is secondary only, not primary, then I can process CM status messages and go into resiliency and partial mode easier. If you ever lose the primary, basically the modem reboots. But if you lose the secondary downstream, it just goes to partial mode. So the modem gets marked as P online, partial online, and then you can do a show cable modem partial service and find out why and track down the, the, the information. You might be able to do a full bandwidth capture from the modem itself, like we talked about for P&M, uh, and actually see the ingress or something going on with the modem itself. Here is a way for me to exploit uh, PowerBoost. Um, that, that name was actually uh, trademarked from Comcast, and Cox uses the name as well. Other systems do the same thing, but they might name it something else. Um, a way for me to, like, say, ring the bell. You know, if you're at 
a, a carnival and you're gonna slam the hammer, sledgehammer, and ring the bell. That's what most people are trying to do is they're doing speed tests with Ookla and uh, speedtest.net and all these other places just to see if they can ring the bell. Uh, and if you don't ring the bell, they're gonna hold your feet to the fire and say, hey, why are you not providing the speed you say you're supposed to, marketing to me? Well, Power Boost could do something like this without having to over provision like we do today. Many systems offer, say, let's say 100 megabit per second. Easy math would be 10% over provision. So a 100 meg offering really is provision for 110. That's 110 24-7. Every day, every minute, every hour. Well, instead of doing that, what I could do is exploit Power Boost just to have like an eight second power boost to ring the bell even higher than what I even propose or market. Like for instance, I might say, uh, I'm gonna offer you a 500 megabit per second offering. I'm gonna do settings in my cable modem in CM file to peak at 600 and achieve like maybe a seven or eight second power boost. And then I'm just gonna over provision to like 510, just a, a little bit over the 500 I market. But every time they do the speed test, they're actually seeing more than what they pay for, but only for that eight seconds. I can also do that for upstream, by the way. So some of the thoughts on my downstream, uh, we have full bandwidth capture. You basically are doing a downstream sweep. Uh, we could do ingress testing. I've even sort of kicked around an idea of how to activate RF on the CMTS without having to pay for a license. So, uh, one of those little tricks was I activate some qualm channels out of my CMTS as video, but I don't assign any video content. So I don't assign it as a DOCSIS channel. Because all I'm trying to do is create RF signal. Could be, I like the fact of haystacks, so that I could activate spectrum before I really want to use it just to see if it looks good. And then I could pull the modems with our full bandwidth capture to see what it does look like at each house. So the more modems we have deployed that have full bandwidth capture, the more visibility we have into our network and how clean it is or how poor it is. Second bullet point, 100% or correctable FEC is expected. So that one right there is not worth monitoring anymore. Uh, the correctable FEC with OFDM, just to how it works, you could have one bit uh, that's bad, but it might show 100% or correctable FEC, but it really isn't but it's just a function of the FFT and the time and frequency interleaving and, and how this complex signal works. So don't uh, scream the sky is falling chicken little if you see 100% correctable fact. We're not worried about that. We're worried about uncorrectable fact. We're worried about drop packets. We have PNM functionality that's been uh, expanded upon for DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, we know 3.1 doesn't need a special CM file, but it does require upstream bonding. So if a modem ever had upstream power level issues because of uh, Brady brought up a, a splitter installed backwards in the house. And by the way, that drawing that he showed should have swapped the cable modem and TV because the cable modem would have still had three and a half dB of loss no matter, even though that splitter was backwards because of how you looked at the input and output. It was just going output input instead of input output. But the TV was output output and that was a problem. Um, but if I did have a problem where the splitter was backwards and the cable modem was on the output output port to port isolation issue, it might have to overcome 20 dB of port to port isolation. So now it has to transmit 20 dB hotter. It's not going to work. It's not going to register upstream bonding. It might actually register an upstream 2.0 mode. And if it did, the 3.1 modem might never come online. I've actually seen a 3.1 modem not come up upstream bonding, we call it MTC mode, and it just cycles off on, off on. It's really off and, and init R1 off, and it don't, so it just cycles back and forth. Never even comes up in 2.0 mode and won't come up in 3.0 downstream mode e either. But it was an upstream power level issue because one of the requirements of 3.1 is it has to be upstream bonded for 3.1 downstream to work. So we do have performance features supported, are drastically, dramatically affected by firmware of the cable modem. So hopefully. Nowadays, we're up to date with cable modems. Fiber deep architectures are just going to give us better performance. And if we go distributed access architecture, remote fire, remote Mac fire, I don't care which one, uh, we're going to have much better MER to support higher modulation schemes that are supported in 3.1.
We definitely need to exploit and utilize CMTS features for self-healing, downstream resiliency, partial mode, load balancing, you name it. And then when we get further down the road and more complexity, then we look at external PMA uh, and software-defined networks to maybe monitor all the cable modems, all the subcarriers, and make intelligent decisions. But now we're talking about a lot more complexity and number crunching, because that's going to be a lot of information to pull and uh, and make decisions. Could be artificial intelligence or uh, what do we call it, um, machine learning. So if you're there, all right. I see we have I think a chat here. Make sure. If the PLC is impaired, does that impact the entire channel's ability to operate? Yeah, I mean, if the PLC goes down, basically it's like saying I lost my primary channel and it's going to drop offline. So it's not even going to go to partial mode. It's going to cycle offline and try to come back again. So let's continue here. There we go. So here is looking at using say a default type of configuration for OFDM, where it was a cyclic prefix of 1024, uh, one megahertz guard band override, that's not even default. The default with some of these settings would have made this guard band more like 1.5 megahertz, which is a lot of wasted guard band. Subcarrier spacing 50 kilohertz, that was the first thing people used, and you know, when you start out, you start out slow. Um, but if we optimize and change our cyclic prefix, and drop to a 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, you have finer granularity of your subcarrier. So you, you have a lot more subcarriers, but it doesn't create a CPU issue. We're not processing every subcarrier individually. Uh, it's all an FFT. Um, but look at the speed difference. We went from, with a 4K QAM modulation, we go from 1.5 gig to 1.8. So we gain 20% uh, efficiency or speed by optimizing some of our settings. I wrote down to maximize your speeds. I even dropped my cyclic prefix even more down to 192. Um, but these are always trade-offs. I could get better speed and it could look great in a lab, but in a real cable plant, what if I have a poor plant and roll off? I have low MER at the high end, maybe even the low end. Maybe changing the cyclic prefix makes those MERs come back up again. Uh, and that's some things that you need to experiment with. So profile control, um, the, con the control modulation, some people call it the data profile or profile A or profile zero. That's the profile a modem comes up on first. And then once the modem starts telling the CMTS his MER for all his subcarriers, then he can change over to the other profiles that you've assigned. Now that modem will load up those profiles when he registers. So you might have assigned a 4K, 2K, 1K QAM profile, but he's going to load up on the 256 QAM profile first, nice and robust, loads up, starts sending his MER back to the CMTS and says, hey, these look good enough. I do my comparison that I should be able to run 4K QAM. And then he changes his mod profile to 4K QAM. This is getting to the profile management. So doing kind of a step by step. You know, cable modem comes online, he locks on the profiles, he locks on the control profile first, he loads up the other data profiles that you've assigned. Now, you could have a lot more than five or six profiles configured in the CMTS, but a word of caution there is the cable modem itself can only lock on, it has like NV RAM for like five. And I believe it's four data profiles and then the control profile, the, you know, the one it locks on when it first registers. So if you make too many and the modem says, hey, I have this really complex type of signature and I notice there's a profile that would I could use, but it's not loaded in my NVRAM in the modem, but I see it's on the CMTS. So how can I get that profile loaded in? Now the cable modem has to do something called DBC, dynamic bonding change, to get the information. And every time it does a DBC, it's got, not going to be as seamless as it would be if it loaded a profile already in the modem. So you could lose, with a DVC, I could lose six seconds or so of layer three connectivity. Whereas if the profile is already loaded in the modem, it could change it on the fly and lose nothing, basically. So the CMTS pulls the cable modem with the OFDM profile test to get the receive MER for all the subcarriers, all the active subcarriers. Um, 
in reality, we are getting MER readings from the, um, not the probes, uh, the pilot, the probes or pilots. Now I'm confusing myself. But if you ever look at an OFDM with a spectrum analyzer, you'll notice there are some subcarriers that are 6 dB higher than the rest. And those are uh, random and random probes. Ah, I just lost my mind. Either way, we're getting the MER from those probes, and they're like QPSK, so they're really robust, but they're 6 dB higher also. And then we subtract 6 dB to get you the MER reading of what it would be for a real subcarrier that's running data. So that's how it's really working. So we periodic pull the modems for the receive MER, and then we adjust the profile as needed. And there are some settings I'm going to give you that dictate the interval. Like how often do I probe? How often do I change? How quickly would I change back? You won't want a modem changing modulation back and forth and thrashing. That's not some something we want either. It's just going to create more CPU in their CMTS. So this internal process we call internal PMA. So there's PMA that I'll go into later, external, where I use external servers and devices to keep track of all the information and make these decisions. And maybe it gets a little bit more complex. So we look at the MER reading, it's in the quarter dB increments. Uh, we can exclude some subcarriers, and by default, it's 2%. The reason I bring that up is, what if you have 8,000 subcarriers, 7,500 are active, the other ones are probes and a cyclic prefix and some other sub subcarriers that aren't used for data. So we look at the MER of all the active subcarriers, and one, only one, has a low MER and it's in the roll off. Are you really going to change the modulation of your entire block for that one subcarrier? So, no. So, by default, we said ignore 2% of them. So, 2%, no big deal. Uh, we found the robustness of OFDM to be such that we're recommending 10% ignore. That way, we can run higher modulation schemes and not be prematurely knocked down to a lower modulation just because a subset of subcarriers, maybe 10 out of 8,000 are bad. Um, there's gotta be that inflection point, right? Is how much do I wanna suffer? Uh, what's really dropping out? And this FFT and low latency uh, LD, LDCP, LDPC, uh, is actually more robust than I thought it was. We can do mixed mod profiles. Um, I'm wondering now if I do know about high end roll off because of Diflex filters, if it would be good to do a mixed mod profile where you do a lower modulation where you know it rolls off. So you know you're going to get lower MER, but instead of changing modulation for the whole block, what if I just say that higher end roll off, I'll run it at 256 qualm and just be done with it? Uh, and I know the MER cutoff at 256 qualm is pretty low to begin with. As a catch all, if I don't get any MER readings back from the cable modem because it's that jacked up, uh, if I get a CM status message or uncorrectable FEC or unlocked QAM, then the modem will go into partial mode. So even if the MER readings are not quite, if I'm too aggressive or I'm not conservative enough and 4K QAM is wor not working at all, but it's not changing my profile on the fly, then eventually it'll go to partial mode. This was looking at the table I talked about in the cable lab spec, uh, where the cutoffs were. And this was in quarter dB increments. So I put it in regular dB. Uh, for 2K qualm, 37 dB. 1K qualm had to be greater than 34. So you'll see most people say 35. Uh, 4K qualm, 41. But these are 6 dB more conservative than they really need to be. So what we're recommending is reduce those 2 to 3 dB. I still like to have about a 3 dB headroom, but this is no longer a binary decision of like single carrier qualm. It works, it doesn't work. That's binary. Works, it doesn't work. With OFDM, it works good, it works well, it works better, it doesn't work at all. So then it's not binary anymore. It's multiple options of different modulation for different modems, and we're continuously tracking the subcarrier MER of every single modem. Here was uh, 
uh, looking at the 2% where we injected, and this is not frequency versus amplitude. This is subcarriers, which is frequency, versus MER. So what you're looking at here is some single carrier qualm, eight channels of single carrier qualm, injected underneath an OFDM, creating low MER at the frequencies where it was injected. So if you took this and flipped it upside down, that would be your qualm haystacks. Notice that the MERs are actually good in between the qualm haystacks because there's guard band, so the MERs aren't bad right there in between the qualm haystacks. But by injecting this level, we found that we didn't take a huge hit on our MER until we really exceeded lower than 25 dB MER. Then everything started getting bad, which is kind of interesting in how the fast Fourier transform and the time and frequency interleaving is working. So if some from this are recommendations, 10% uh, ex exclude or exempt, meaning I'm going to ignore 10% of the subcarriers for my decisions on profile management. I'm going to uh, drop my internal table by 12 quarters, which is 3 dB. So I'm basically saying, instead of 41 dB MER for 4K qualm, I'm going to say 38 dB. Anything below 38, I'm going to have to drop to 2K qualm. Um, we know that the cable modem transmits to the CMTS is on profile zero. Some people call it profile A. Uh, that's my control profile. And normally you'll make that 256 qualm sort of match up with DOCSIS 3.0. CMTS periodically polls that modem. Uh, the catch-all I talked about was a CM status message. So if, if the profile is unfit and it's not changing modulation, then eventually it'll go to uh, partial mode. The next to the last bullet point, I kind of bring this one up because I think it's good for test equipment with built-in cable modems. You can statically map a cable modem, I say cable modem, MAC address, to a particular data profile. So you could say, you know what, I want my test equipment to be so robust, I don't want it going through this profile management. Maybe I'll say, I want you to stick with uh, profile one, which is uh, 1K qualm, or profile zero, the data profile, the control profile, so you stick the 256 qualm, and I'm gonna use you for testing. And then I'm not, I don't want you bouncing between different mod profiles, because I'm actually using that test equipment to move around in my cable plant, and I want him locked all the time. So the cable modem can lock to four profiles and the one control profile. And, and the way I look at that is control profile zero is probably 256 qualm. I actually like to make, uh, we list it as profile one, two, three, four. I like to make profile four, 4K qualm, because it's the number. Uh, profile two, 2K qualm. Profile one, 1K qualm. Profile three, maybe I make that my mixed profile or I don't use it at all. Sometimes I manipulate what numbers I use just so it makes sense when I see it. So a lot of customers have started to utilize our recommendations and they're getting a lot more devices running higher modulation than they did before. They might have been half of them were running 512 qualm and they're running now 4K qualm, 10% of them. The modems that are probably one amplifier away from the node. We used to get in node plus five amplifiers, yeah, you get lower MER, so then maybe some of those are running 2K qualm, and some are running 1K qualm. So then we get into profile management. And uh, let me do a, a time check. 255, wow. Um, so the profile management is sort of the cable labs push on adding more complexity uh, or smarts. Maybe I artificial intelligence, machine learning, external server, monitoring all the cable modems, all the, the subcarriers, all the MERs, and making decisions with that external device. Pushing it to the cable modem, say, hey, I just made you this special mod profile that has exclusion bands, and, and uh, we can't really do that right now with exclusion bands because it's really a, a RF hardware thing um, that's for the controller channel. Um, but we could change modulation, for many different subcarriers. We could do a mixed modulation where it's 512 qualm at the low end and 1K in the middle and 256 where LTE interference might reside and 256 where it's high in roll off and then 4K qualm everywhere else. So we could really do a, a highly optimized profile for each individual modem. 
but I like to steer towards the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, uh, for now. Uh, a lot of people like a cookie cutter template, something that's simple to push across the entire footprint and see how it goes from there, and then start to get more complex as you go. Here was looking at uh, two different comparisons of the Cyclic Prefits 1024, 50K, uh, 50 kilohertz, and then the other one we showed a 512 Cyclic Prefix and 25 kilohertz subcarrier. Um, with 1K qualm, well, this one couldn't even run 1K qualm because they, the customer didn't want to do it and they were scared. They only got one gigabit per second out of this entire lock. Whereas when we optimize, we're getting 1.5 gig because we're running higher modulation and less overhead because better cyclic prefix and smaller, more granular subcarrier spacing. So this increased my channel by almost 50% just by doing that. And I'm not even running 4K qualm here. Really, we can get close to two gigabit per second from one block if we optimize everything. And, da, 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 da. and I believe I I, lo I sent these these slides to uh, uh, Mike, I believe, and I think he's going to put it on a place for people to download. So I have information here. You can look at it later on. Uh, I have step by step some step by step information as well. Let's move on to OFDMA. Actually, is there any questions? No. Let me see, anything in the chat? Does that static profile on test equipment affect speed tests done locally on that meter? Of, of course it would if you're locked only to that one, but I think some of the test equipment, someone from Viabi might be able to, to verify, is you might be able to manually change the profile through the test equipment. I used to do the same thing with load balancing. I would exclude my internal cable modem on the test equipment from load balancing because I didn't want it moving around on me when I was trying to test the the fidelity or the performance of a single upstream or specific upstream and then all of a sudden the CMTS is overriding my test equipment well I didn't want that either so there's things that you like to exclude the test equipment from you don't want it just hopping around all over the place but you might even say well I'm going to hard code my test equipment to 1k qualm because I'm going to use that for speed tests. I even wonder if some of the test equipment has two MAC addresses in it. You could assign the one MAC address to a real robust static profile, and then you could assign the other internal cable modem MAC address to the highest modulation profile, uh, hoping it works, and then you can do that for speed tests. Just some thoughts. So OFDMA, the biggest channel width is 96 megahertz. Uh, the smallest you can do is 11 megahertz when you're doing 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. If you're doing 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, you can make a channel as small as 6.4 with half megahertz garbands on each side, makes it 7.4. But if you're going to do OFDMA, why would you mess around with such a small channel? Like I said, the smaller the channel, the worse the efficiency. So I want to use that OFDMA to its advantages. I don't promote the low spectrum, five to 15 megahertz. I know it is more robust, but my goal with OFDMA is more speed. So I want to exploit it as best I can by putting in the upper spectrum, you know, maybe 20, 25 to 40 megahertz. And then below 25 megahertz, I might just have two single carrier qualms because I don't need so many anymore because the 2.0 modems went through attrition. And the 3.0 modems, I pushed the high end users to the 3.1 modem. So the 3.0 modems still to two channel bonding, by the way, when you go from four-channel upstream bonding to two-channel upstream bonding, you gain 3 dB in max transmit power. So the modems have a little bit more power if you drop down to two-channel upstream bonding, at least for the 3.0 modems. Um, OFDMA, just like downstream OFDM, there are a lot of options for configuration, a lot of support. Uh, we look at many slots on the upstream, just like many slots uh, on DOCSIS 3.0 and 2.0, but now a mini slot is really equivalent to 400 kilohertz of spectrum uh, for OFDMA, which, by the way, brings up a problem with RFOG. You, with RF over glass, you have many devices trying to transmit, and if they transmit at the same instant in time, they're all going to the same optical receiver, so they collide with each other, and they cause optical bead interference, OBI. 
So we figured out how to work with single carrier qualms by synchronizing them together. So if a modem bursts, it has to use all the upstreams. But OFDMA is in many slots. So me and my neighbor could be transmitted at the same instant time, but he uses one frequency and I'm using another frequency. Well, that's going to cause OBI, and that's not going to work. Um, on top of that, if the ONT needs a certain amount of power to, to turn on, because it usually has a history, not a hysteresis, but it has a certain threshold where if it's ingress, the internal filter won't open up and the mo that the ONT at the house won't turn its laser on because you don't want to be lazing junk coming from the house. So it looks for a certain threshold. Well, it turns out with OFDMA, that 400 kilohertz power is almost 12 dB lower than if the whole channel burst. So that sometimes will not even turn on the ONT to transmit properly. So OFDMA not supported with RFOG. Um, so that's just a, a side note. We still rely on IUCs, interval usage codes. And that basically that's another term for mod profiles. So these mod profiles are more options for DOCSIS 3.1 upstream. We have DOCSIS 3.0 and 2.0, we had advanced UGS, advanced long, advanced short. That was IUC 9, 10, 11. We had a short and long burst, IUC 5 and 6, for DOCSIS 2.0 modems, um, or 1.1 one, one modems. Uh, when we went to 2.0, we went to the, the ATDMA and advanced uh, IUCs 9, 10, 11. Um, now we have even more. We have uh, we can use 5 and 6. We can use 9, 10, 11. But then we have a, a 12 and a 13 as well. IUC 13, it's weird. The highest number, IUC, is actually going to be our upstream control mod profile, modulation, or IUC. So when the modem comes online, it's going to range on the upstream, and it's going to use this IUC 13, the more robust modulation. And then once the CMTS sees all the subcarriers and those DMERs, then it can assign it the different IUC. Say, oh, you know what? You look so good, you could do 2K qualm in the upstream. And by the way, that is supported now. But I haven't seen a lot of modem support 4K qualm in the upstream yet. So 25 kilohertz, less overhead than 50 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, but I've seen uh, weird issues with certain modems. They didn't like 25 kilohertz, so I had to uh, revert back to 50 kilohertz just to get all the modems to work properly. Uh, I can optimize my cyclic prefix. There's something called pilot patterns that could reduce some code word errors. Um, maybe you have some impulse noise uh, that the pilot pattern might actually help out, especially if you're trying to do below 20 megahertz where there might be more impulse noise. So there are trade-offs of speed versus robustness. And there always will be. Um, so I try to optimize for speed, but then I set thresholds that are realistic that if the modem has poor performance or poor MER, it might not be poor performance yet. It might be the MER is bad and it's getting close to poor performance and the MER is reported bad and then it could drop to a lower modulation proactively before the performance gets bad. So, uh, we really like to avoid noisy spectrum below 20, 10 megahertz. But I also didn't realize in North America with 42 megahertz spectrum, we don't have much to work with. Some general thoughts, you know, four ATDMA channels for DOCSIS 3.0, the max output is 51 dBmV. If you did a 10 times a log of four of those, you'd add 6 dB, you have 50, 57 dBm total power. If you take that total power for eight channels, if you have a eight channel bonded modem on the upstream, uh, 51, if it could do 51, plus, plus nine, 10 times a log of eight, is 60 dBmV total power. If you look at a DOCSIS 3.1 modem, its max transmit is 65 dBmV. So technically a 3.1 modem replacing a 3.0 modem is gonna have more power to work with right from the beginning. Five dB if you do kind of an apples to apples. Uh, eight, you know, when it's five, eight dB if you just compare four channel upstream bonding to a 3 1 modem. So a 3 1 modem is going to give us more power and maybe, you know, it's meant to be used up to 204, but if you use it in place of a 42 or 65 or 85 megahertz spectrum, you're going to have more power to work with. The reporting is based on 1.6 megahertz, 
So don't be confused when you replace a 3.0 modem with a 3.1 modem and the modem transmit level is 6 dB lower. It's not really 6 dB lower, it's reporting 6 dB lower because it's reporting based on 1.6 instead of 6.4. So you take 10 times a log of 6.4 divided by 1.6, that ends up being 10 times a log of 4, 10 times a log of 4 is 6 dB. So there's a 6 dB correction factor that you'd have to add to the modem transmit level to get back to what you were with DOCSIS 3.0. So that, that's, that can be a, a head scratcher for a lot of people because you're upgrading from a 3.0 to a 3.1 modem and you're like wondering why the, the modem transfer level dropped. It really didn't drop, the reporting dropped. Um, Brady brought this up and that's a T4 multiplier. You know, he mentioned the station maintenance every 20 seconds and it turns out with Cisco CMTS, if we're doing line card redundancy, we actually send station maintenance every 15 seconds. So we have a little bit more often. But if you're doing four channel upstream bonding, the four, the T4 multiplier is a 4x multiplier. So four times 15 is 60 seconds. You're not going to get upstream MER, upstream levels, upstream pre-EQ for 60 seconds. Um, so if you make changes in the field, you might have to wait a little while before that 60 seconds comes around and the modem updates its MER, its levels, and pre-equalization taps. That's the I, I consider it almost like a the pitfall of a T4 multiplier. It does alleviate too much station maintenance on the downstream and the upstream, but then it 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 takes away the granularity of my reporting of upstream MER, upstream levels, upstream pre-EQ. So it's it's a kind of a I almost think a, t a multiplier of two would be better, but it is what it is. That can be changed by the way manually. Um, your max transmit doesn't change much if we go from uh four oh, how do i want to say this oh if i do cross bond a ofdma with a single carrier qualm i'm giving myself an extra station maintenance so if one or the other goes down it stay, it'll still stay up and running because we do station maintenance on both we don't have the idea of a primary channel in the upstream but sort of it is Every upstream does station maintenance. So if you're doing two channel upstream bonding, cross bonding OFDMA with single carrier qualm, both of them are doing station maintenance. If you lose one, you don't lose the other, it stays up and running. Unlike downstream, you lose the primary, you lose the mode. So you have better resiliency. Uh, by adding in a single carrier qualm with the OFDMA, there isn't a huge change in max transmit because it's a relative thing. A 6.4 megahertz OFD or ATDMA compared to a 20 megahertz OFDMA is not much at all. Uh, also, we scheduled scheduled flows like voice on a single carrier qualm because we can control jitter and latency. OFDMA is still in the works to support UGS. So right now, if you have a DOCSIS 3.1 EMTA, you really need to have a single carrier qualm in that upstream bonding group so the voice call can be steered to the single carrier qualm and control uh, jitter and latency. So, yeah, let's see. Chat, anyone uh, keeping me on time? Uh, let's see, doesn't that also, the, the other question, doesn't that also apply to 3.2 megahertz wide ATMA channels? Those would be 3 dB different than 6.4 channel? Correct, exactly. Uh, at least on the Cisco CMTS. On the Cisco CMTS, we, we keep same average power, not power per hertz, meaning, if you look at a spectrum analyzer in the head end, a 1.6 megahertz wide channel will be this high, a 3.2 will be 3 dB lower, and a 6.4 will be 3 dB lower than, than that one. So, um, but with that said, an OFDMA channel, this gets confusing, it reports its level based on 1.6, but its ranging is based on 6.4. That means, once an OFDMA channel ranges on the upstream and comes up, if you look at a spectrum analyzer, regardless of the width of the OFDMA channel, it will be the same height on a spectrum analyzer as a 6.4. If it was following the same average power like the 1.6, the 3.2, and the 6.4, as you got wider, it would get lower and lower, but it doesn't. So what we do is we do same average power up to 6.4, and then once you go past 6.4 on an OFDMA, we do power per hertz. So as you add more, it'll stay the same reference level on the spectrum analyzer. So you're still getting the same MER, same CNR across the board, regardless of 
that block width, but now you're running into power level potential issues. More spectrum means the modem has to put out more total power. Oh. I think that is, oh, wait a minute. With OFDMA, there seems to be disproportionately higher correctable effect in measurements at this port, correct? Can you speak of the difference in error correction in OFDMA than ATMA and how that translates to correctable? No. <laughs> that, like I mentioned on downstream, downstream you can see 100% correctable effect. So don't even bother monitoring it. On upstream, it's a, it's, it's, it's a wishy-washy on that one. It's not quite 100% correctable effect, but you'll see very high correctable for correctable effect percentage but because of the complex nature of OFDM, OFDMA uh, it's expected so don't use that as a, an excuse to say my plan is bad really you know we're worried about uncorrectable effect all right i think that catches me up on on the chat all right so 42 megahertz 100 megabit per second atdma uh, if you mixed OFDMA with ATDMA in a 42 megahertz, you could get about 150 megabit per second aggregate, and you could offer 100 meg service. And that seems to be my holy grail. What I'm trying to get out of a 42 megahertz system is to offer 100 meg service. And the only way to do it is to add OFDMA and start getting rid of some ATDMA. If I do an 85 megahertz split, I have a lot more options here. I don't prescribe or promote doing single carrier qualm above 42 megahertz. I think you're just asking for trouble with 2O modems, house filters, 3O modems that don't have 85 filters in them. Um, and I really think we should relegate that spectrum to OFDMA and get the most bang for our buck. So if I do a mid split up to 85 megahertz, I keep my four single carrier qualms on the low end. I do 45 megahertz of 2K qualm, so it's more robust assuming maybe no plus two, no plus three cascade, I could get a 500 megabit per second aggregate speed. So I could easily offer 300 meg service. Not quite where we want to get to, because originally, eventually we want to get to one gig. So the only way we're going to get to one gig is 204. So if we do a 204, 258 split, which is available now, you just got to make sure your cable modem support it, you could achieve about a 1.5 gig aggregate and offer a one gig service. So there's no problem there, but to do a 204 megahertz system, we know there's, there's, there's hurdles with that as well. There's no special nodes, no echo cancellation like FDX requires. There's no, no, no plus zero, no plus one architecture requirements like FDX. Um, really there's no requirement for DAA, but DAA will definitely make it more palatable. It will make it easier because I'm a little nervous about upstream 204 with an analog upstream laser causing laser clipping. Uh, I know there are some other options besides DAA, and that is EDR, the, the enhanced digital return, where you digitize the upstream and send it back as a digital link, so that gets rid of laser clipping. So this is looking at 204. Um, I have some single carrier qualm. It's not quite the, the ideal scenario, because notice I have single carrier qualm above 42. But notice I purposely put a gap in here because if a modem has a 42 filter and I put a carrier there, that filter will still allow that carrier to be seen and with poor MER, it'll lock on and it'll range, but it'll be really poor MER and it might go to partial mode. If I just avoid that spectrum altogether, the filter in the motor rolls off hard enough, it will never try to range on the upstream that's further up, like closer to 50 megahertz. So I purposely kind of avoid that gap. Above 85, I, I did uh, 2K qualm, 23 megahertz of that, and then I did 96 from 108 all the way up to 204 uh, and running a pretty high modulation scheme, pretty aggressive, uh, but I could get about 1.2 gigabit per second from that. If I were to get rid of the single carrier qualm and go from 40 megahertz up to 108, now I get a 1.575 gigabit per second aggregate pipe. So I can offer a one gig service, no problem. There's a problem with this scenario as well. What if a modem has an 85 megahertz filter? If it sees half of a block, it can't be told to use half a block. That's not how profile management works. Profile management says use the whole block, but change the modulation. 
there's no such thing as saying, ah, just use half a block or you're bad, so use half a block. There's actually some work in progress with Cable Labs now to figure out how to do this. Um, and it wouldn't be uh, use half a block, it'd be more like only schedule your upstream uh, up to a certain frequency and don't schedule in the whole block. So it's still kind of locked on the whole upstream block, but it won't schedule its upstream traffic past the point where it's bad. And that'll be an interesting scenario. But for now, we can track the MER of a modem when it comes online. In this scenario, that modem with 85 filter would end up in partial mode. Uh, these two would not work, and it would end up using four upstream single carrier qualm, but say instead of UB, it would say slash P or partial upstream mode. And then if someone changed the house filter in the house or the cable modem itself, then it would automatically come out of partial mode and go to uh, full upstream bonding. So this same problem, by the way, I've seen with the 65 megahertz uh, filter as well in Europe. So I still got to worry about that 65 cutoff as well. If I am worried about the filters in the house and I'm worried about FM radio, I could just avoid it. I could do a 108 to 204 with 96 megahertz full block, and I could do a 40 to 85 with a secondary block. And I just avoid the 85 to 108. I avoid those modems with 85 filter issues because they'll just lock on that one block. Uh, and I avoid the FM radio potential ingress. Yes, I have lost some spectrum and some utilization or some speed, but it dropped from 1.5 to 1.375. So I could still probably offer a one gig service offering with a 1.375 aggregate. Here was one idea of doing something like this where we actually did from 85 down and we started Rob Peter to pay Paul. We stole some ATDMA channels away and extended our OFDMA further down. And we did a 108 to 204 on the uh, 96 megahertz. And we ended up with a 1.425 gigabit aggregate pipe. And I wrote some the good, the bad, the ugly, what it could offer, what it could do. Um, you know, one of the, the pitfalls of doing a 204 is if I have a 138 megahertz CLI, cumulative leakage index uh, for ingress testing and egress testing, if you will, for aeronautical interference, how am I going to inject a signal at the head end to broadcast out if my upstream goes to 204? I need the modems to transmit 138 on the upstream and then go out with test equipment and look for it. And Cable Labs is looking to address that with this OUDP test burst, where they can have test equipment talk to the cable modem, tell the cable modem, burst out a signal with a certain signature. And as I go around my test equipment, I can see if that signal is leaking out of the drop cable, out of the taps, out of the hardline cable as I drop around. Another issue with going past 85, 204, is adjacent device interference. And that one's gonna to have to be addressed individually by everyone that's deploying. And that is, can the other devices in someone's house accept the power level coming from this cable modem? Because normally cable modems were not transmitting past 42 megahertz. Now you've got a cable modem in the house tied together with a splitter, and maybe that signal port to port bleed over starts loading up into my other equipment in my house, my other CPE. Can that other equipment handle it? If not, I might have to start putting filters on like we do for Mocha. And then what do you do about set-top boxes? You know, more and more people are looking to go to actual over-the-top video, MPEG-4, IP video, and get rid of set-top boxes altogether. But when you have millions of set-top boxes, that's a hard pill to swallow. So it is what it is, and we address it as we get there. Um, I also wrote down condition taps, and I'll go into that later because when you go to 204 megahertz, you definitely have issues with temperature and coax loss at different frequencies. Here was my OFDMA config recommendations. Uh, this came from uh, Jason Miller, looking at the different IUCs or mod profiles. Uh, they had a 2K qualm, 1K qualm, 512, 256, 128, 64. IUC 13 is the one the modem will use to lock on, so we made it nice and robust. Uh, the pilot pattern kept the overhead down. Um, but if I find that I need a little bit more robustness to impulse noise, I can change the pilot pattern and sacrifice a little bit more speed for more robustness. This is a 108 to 204, so a full 96 megahertz. Uh, looking at the well, 2K QAM, that's 875 megahertz per second for that one block. If I increase the pilot pattern to 11 because of impulse noise or problems, 
I went from 875 to 800. So I gave up 75 meg to get a little bit more robustness. This was looking at an override where if you do know you have some spectrum that is a little iffy, susceptible to ingress, maybe uh, an unknown taxi cab driver or something like that, you can go under each one of these IUCs and say, oh yeah, IUC 6 is 2K qualm, but between 175 and 180 megahertz, I want it to always be 16 qualm with a higher pilot pattern. So that's only five megahertz, so it's not too bad. But you're giving yourself insurance that no matter which mod profile it ends up using, in that one part of the spectrum, it's always going to be 16 qualm. So we do cross bond with single carrier qualm and OFDMA. Like I said, we need it for UGS and voice anyway. It also gives me redundancy, meaning two upstream channels for resiliency. If one goes down, the other one stays up. Um, you will find that unlike downstream, where the downstream OFDM seems to load up to 90% before a 3 -1 modem will start bleeding over to the single carrier qualm. On the upstream, because of scheduling and time and all that, you might get the 40% or 50% OFDMA loading, and that modem could start scheduling on the single carrier qualm. And it's all a function of the max transmit burst, some of the other settings, uh, um, the mini slot size, how quick it is, uh, other traffic. So there's a lot of things that come into play on the upstream that's not really there on the downstream. Downstream, blasting it out. Upstream, you have to schedule, request, grant, request, grant. Um, what you will find is we load traffic according to the spec. From mini slot zero, which is the furthest left side of your spectrum, to the right. Here's another reason I don't like to use OFDMA at the low end of my spectrum, five to 15. So even if you did five to 30 megahertz, when we schedule the traffic, it's starting at the very low at five megahertz, which is the worst part of the spectrum. So knowing that, that could end up with a lot of uncorrectable FEC and low MER and modulation is changing because of that low MER. Sometimes it's just, you know, like I said, out to prevention with the pound of cure. Avoid those frequencies altogether and throw your, maybe a 1.6 or maybe a 3.2 megahertz channel down there um, if you want to squeeze out a little bit more. And then the 6.4 is at 18 and, and 20 and then OFDMA up above that. Also, I found that 3-1 modems seem to prefer OFDMA for ranging first. So even though the UCDs, upstream channel descriptors, get sent on the downstream and modem looks at the UCD, a 3-1 modem will always range on 3-1 first. There is an override feature that can be deployed now where you can tell the modems, I know you're a 3-1 modem, but I want you to range on upstream one at 24 megahertz ATDMA before you range on the OFDMA. So you can override that. Then we get into profile management. Let's see, any more chats? No chats. And time check, 325. All right, I think I'm coming towards the end. Uh, we can assign it, the OFDMA channel up to seven IUCs, or mod profiles, if you will. Uh, and then the modem only gets to use two of them at a time. So if the modem is using 2K qualm across the board, uh, it could have loaded in there and say, well, I need to quickly change to 512, and it can change to 512. Uh, no loss in traffic because it automatically changes right away, and then it uh, starts transmitting on the lower modulation, more robust. Uh, that default, I believe, for probing is every 60, I had it written down. It can be changed, but I think it's every 60 seconds. And we are actually looking at the average MER of a mini slot, which is 400 kilohertz of subcarriers. So if you have 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, that would be four as a meg times four, that's 16. 16 subcarriers would be averaged together for 400 kilohertz worth of spectrum, a mini slot, and that MER would be what's actually being used for the decision. When you report the MER, you can see the MER of every subcarrier, but the decision is based on the average of a mini slot. So 16 of those. This is the same table that's used for downstream. It's also used for upstream. So same cutoffs as what the downstream was. Um, opposite of what we recommended on downstream of getting rid of some of that extra conservative numbers on thresholds, because upstream is a little bit more 
jumpy and breathing and moving. And because we average the MER to mini slot, we're recommending for now to keep the default thresholds, uh, the the two percent, I two percent exclude and um, the extra six dB robustness for now. And then once we find that things are pretty stable, maybe we decide we change some pilot patterns, get a little bit more robustness, impulse noise. Then maybe we experiment a little bit more with what constitutes a mod profile change. Like what thresholds, or how should I change my thresholds? This is some iOS code that added more operational ability to Doxus 3.1. You know, implementing Doxus 3.1 in and of itself is not a good idea. We have to operationalize it, meaning how does it work in a real plant? When I say real, quote unquote, I'm talking dirty, noisy, moving, changing, uh, you name it, all these things, you know, uh, trains going by, shaking, contraction, expansion, hot, cold, wind, uh, squirrels chewing it and all that, besides customers messing around with it. Uh, these are some of the recommendations for profile management. So you can see there's a lot of suggestions here. The polling interval every 10 seconds. I think you can go as low as uh, five minutes or seconds. That's so minutes. Okay, minutes. I think you can go as low as five minutes, but you don't want to create more CPU overhead by polling so often. So every 10 minutes is good. Um, the bottom one was a new one just added in latest iOS that if the modem reports poor MER before it even fully registers, we can put it into partial mode because we know it probably has a house amp with a filter that's rolling it off. So some of the thoughts uh, on OFDMA, Docs 3 went upstream, you know, it's come a lot further than it used to, but in the US, we're still stuck with 42 megahertz plants. So uh, trying to squeeze out some 3.1 spectrum is difficult. Uh, some systems are going to 85 megahertz and some are even looking at 204. 204 has its own hurdles, like I talked about, uh, but we're getting past some of those hurdles and maybe just cherry picking some areas of the plant where I'll trial 204 uh, before I ubiquitously deploy it across the plant. And the last bullet point, OFDMA does not fix bad plants. So don't think you're just gonna add something more robust technology and, and forget about your plant. So increasing your spectrum, more coax loss, more tilt. Uh, not only am I worried about modem transmit levels, but there's one part of the spec a lot of people don't look at. It's called the dynamic range window. A modem is allowed to transmit different levels for different channels to overcome the tilt at those different frequencies. So just like pre-equalization can pre-equalize one channel, well, the modem is going to have to transmit different levels. And OFDMA has pre-equalization as well. So in that block, it can tilt a little bit. But what about the tilt between each channel? If I have a channel at OFDMA at 200 megahertz, and maybe that's where I do my initial ranging, and then I have a single carrier qualm at 10 megahertz, that's a big disparity in spectrum. It doesn't sound like much, but when you go through drop cable, five amplifiers, and the node, you know, there's no tilt in fiber, but you have all that coax and temperature affected, sun loading on black jacketed aerial coax, that's pretty excessive, uh, and you have no upstream AGC. It's downstream AGC or ALC, but there's no upstream AGC. We rely on the cable modems to change their levels to hit the CMTS flat. Well, according to the spec, the modem transmit levels can't be more than 12 dB in difference, and that problem can be exacerbated if you have narrow carriers and wide carriers all in the same upstream bonding group. Uh, so how do I get rid of that? I need taps with tilt opposite of the coax. So I need flexible solution taps or equalized taps. More upstreams lead to laser clipping, so I am concerned about analog upstream lasers, so DAA would be the way to go. We have no upstream AGC, but one way to shrink my modem transport level bell curve to maybe 48 dBmV with plus, three, plus minus three dB on the modem transport levels is Balance my upstream with taps, equalized taps. That would help. Um, this is um, cascades are going to be a problem. Uh, if you go to 204 and you change the diplex filter, you're going to have to get rid of step attenuators, taps that had built in filters, home house amps with filters. 
anything that actually has cutoffs that cause group delay and actually cut off 42 or 85. You have your legacy set-top box you gotta worry about, digital analog converters, uh, leakage testing, we talked about OUDP to fix that. Adjacent device interference where the modem mounts are transmit so high in power, it affects other devices in the house. So one way around that is a gateway architecture, right? You go coax, ground block, gateway, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, no coax in the house. Problem solved. <laughs> sure. Uh, and we had a, the talk before me, it was Wi-Fi 6E, right? So uh, that would give us more speed to match up with the 3.1 speeds we're offering and lower latency as well. Uh, the other one is passive device interference. More power from the modem hitting a sub quality splitter directional coupler can actually overdrive the ferrites and material in that splitter and cause intermod. Some people, hum modulation, uh, passive device intermodulation. Um, so you might find that the subpar device in the house is causing the problem to begin with. FM carriage, we don't deal with that in the US, but in Europe they might have to deal with it. Off air broadcast potential interference. If you go to 204 upstream, you could have PBS off air digital broadcasting at you know 105 megahertz or some you know some strange frequency that was allocated to that specific market. So one fix for upstream frequencies is get rid of the coax. <laughs> so slowly but surely we are we're limiting coax low and low and low and low. We're going fiber deeper and deeper. We could utilize condition taps and don't don't get the taps with a built-in uh, uh, backflex filter. Try to get an equalized tap from 5 to 1.2 gig. That way, if you ever change your split, you don't have to worry about the equalizers in those taps anymore. Thermal issues are going to be a concern. Uh, there is talk about maybe if we do DOCSIS 4.0, FDD, uh, extended spectrum DOCSIS, uh, could we look at the downstream AGC circuitry and make decisions for an upstream AGC? So that's, I know ATX, people like that were looking at that. Um, we do have a little bit more power for DOCSIS 3.1 modems than we do for 3.0, so that's going to help us. And my closing points, temperature effects. So here's what my conclusion for now. For a 204 megahertz system with no upstream AGC, uh, no thermal equalizers or anything like that, I would design 48 dBmV plus or minus 3 dB for taps with less than 25 dB of coax loss between the RPD and the tap. That means I have enough range in my cable modem to make up for the changes in temperature at 204, but if I go node, coax, amplifier, 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 drop cable, and, and I look at, at 204 megahertz, and it's more than 25 dB of coax loss, I really should design that tap faceplate for 46 plus or minus 2 dB. So what I'm doing is, I'm trying to build my modem 2 dB of reserve because I know temperature is going to affect those modems more than the modems off of taps that are closer to the RPD or the node. Condition taps are going to help us a lot. Fiber deep with DAA is going to help us a lot. Uh, you need to research your own probably on the ADI, adjacent device interference, and, and the passive device uh, intermod. The 117, if you do test out OFDMA, just keep in mind that 117 invisible boundary because that could force the modem to pick a filter that you didn't want to. So just extend your OFDMA past 117, it'll be fine. Same thing with 65 if you're in Europe or something like that. Uh, I've seen people try to test OFDMA from say 42 to 60 and then the 42 filter kicked in and it didn't work. Legacy device devices eventually go through attrition. So we're hoping 2O modems go away. 1X modems are long gone, and uh, set-top boxes, and and that's a problem, I think, also, is set-top boxes with DSG, DOCS set-top gateway, they could have a 2.0 modem in them, and we're not going to get rid of them for a while, so we have to provide at least one single carrier qualm for upstream and downstream just for those devices. Uh, and that is it. So I think I hit my mark. Questions? Comments? Chat window? What do we got in the chat? Uh oh, here we go. The DRW worries me too. If we didn't change all the taps, we don't change all the taps to include internal conditioning. We need to be more pres prescriptive on return amplifier equalization and possibly adding tilt to the return path to prevent <coughs> eclipsing the 12D threshold at termination. I agree. I have another example is if you know 
the modem is gonna have to transmit hotter at the higher frequency to overcome the tilt. There's another way to fool the system by configuring different levels of frequency. So if the modem at the high end was was having to transmit higher, 12 dB higher than the lower frequency, you could, if you could afford the MER hit, you could tell the CMTS that channel minus three instead of zero. And then that, that modem's transmit power would drop three dB and the DRW will be closer. Because the DRW doesn't care about the CMTS config. It only cares about the modem transmit level. So you could trick it by finagling the CMTS, but remember, when you drop the CMTS 3 dB on the receive level, you drop the modem transmit 3 dB, but that also means that modem is gonna have worse MER at that frequency. Now at that frequency, it might be better anyway, because it's higher frequency, usually better MER. So it's little trade-offs like that that you could manipulate. Yeah, and I think Brady wrote about that in the most recent Broadband Library magazine, too. So some good information in there. Okay, so I think I'm done. I don't know if there's any other questions. Anything else, guys? Let me... I don't know how to unshare my uh, screen. Oh, I'll share my screen. No, I think that I can't thank you enough for uh, taking time out to, to help educate us on the, you know, the, the OFDM and OFDMA. Um, really appreciate it. If you wouldn't mind, can you give us a, uh, a trivia question so we can uh, give away some more swag? <laughs> you should have prepped me first. <laughs> a trivia question. Uh, I always try to make it too tough. How 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 many dB? <laughs> how much correction factor do, do I need to add to a three one modem's transmit level to get back to what typically is reported for a three zero modem? So a 3 one modem has a transmit level reporting. How much do you need to add to that to get back to a 3 0 modem transmit reporting? All right, we have some answers. What's what's the answer? It's 3 dB. Try again. Or is it 6? 6 dB. It, All right. Yeah. Sure. It's you're you're right, that would be 3D, no, 6DB to get back to a 6.4 equivalent. And if you were comparing to 3.2, I think it would be uh, 3DB or is the other way around, 9DB. I got to think about that one now. Yeah, I think it's I think it's 3DB if you were comparing to a 3.2, but if you're comparing to a 6.4, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be 6DB. Good. Great. Perfect. Perfect. We have winners. <laughs> oh, there was uh, one more question here somewhere. What, what was it, Roy? Right? Oh. Is SD QAM stand for single carrier or single channel? So. I think Ron threw this one at me too before Ron Brunt, <laughs> and uh, and it, it's definitely in the spec. It says single carrier qualm, so it's it's a carrier that is uh, modulated, uh, one carrier. That carrier is suppressed, by the way, like a, a 6.4 megahertz wide. Even let's say downstream, six megahertz wide downstream. There's a carrier right in the middle of that qualm haystack, but you don't see it. It is modulated and it's suppressed but it's modulated. So if you got rid of the modulation and all the other stuff, it would look like a CW carrier right in the middle. It's a single carrier qualm. Whereas the OFDM, I, that's why I like to call it a block, right? An OFDM block, so there's no misconstrued information. Um, but it's definitely, every one of those is sub-carriers. So it's a multi-carrier 
channel. Uh, so I guess the term, it's sort of semantics, right? Channel and block to me are the same thing. Like I could say a, a single carrier qualm carrier, single, well, that's, that's redundant. A single carrier qualm channel. How about that? SC qualm is single carrier qualm, and that's a channel. The OFDM is a multi-carrier channel. So I, I, I don't think you could say SC is single channel. Or you sort of could for the SC qualm. <laughs> but to me, channel means the entire thing. So OFDM, channel and block are the same thing. Single carrier qualm, channel and haystack are the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. We're, we're going to squabble. It's like squabbling over DBs, right? I don't squabble over DBs. The debate continues. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, John. As always, uh, appreciate it. Um, your continued dedication to SET and training is, is greatly appreciated. No problem. It's my pleasure. Hoping to be at SET this year. So I think it's September this year in Philly. So hoping, hoping to be there. Hopefully see some people in, in, in face to face. All right. Well, I hope to see you there, John. All right. And, and by the way, <laughs> another plug is uh, I think Brady brought it up is we're going to do a uh, podcast at two o'clock on Friday. Um, and sometimes <laughs> I don't know what we're really going to get into, but it's always everything doxis, you name it. And maybe I'll bring up some stuff I saw at Anga in Germany uh, besides the bottom of a beer glass. Well, I avoided putting the uh, how was the beer in Germany in the chat. We'll have that conversation another time. All right. So thank you, guys. Uh, appreciate all the, the training and uh, participation today from uh, our online audience and the folks in the room. Um, stay tuned to our uh, uh, what about membership? Oh, become a member of SET and join the Penn Ohio chapter. More information at setpennohio.org or set.org and stay tuned to our, our Penn Ohio channel for upcoming trainings and more information. Thank you all for your participation and have a great day. All right, take care.